Welcome back to game two, where Maryville enter up a game over Illinois, and a one-sided game it was, Crumbs. Illinois have selected blue side for game number two, so we'll swap it around as we move through the games in our best of five. Yeah, it was a 13 to two landslide in the favor of Maryville. These, this team is so confident that they're wearing black right now for the funeral that they're about to make of their opponent. They said that themselves, it's amazing. Yeah, I mean, Niles has been trash talking pretty much since he got here by the looks of things. Heard him in the post game. Well, Having he won the three. He's backing That's it up. True. That's He's true. backing up the trash talk, and we love to see that. We love to see the confidence that they know exactly who they're up against and what they're going to do to them. But I think the confidence is being paired with, you know, not just solid early games, but great execution throughout that whole game. Really just felt like they knew what they were doing with the Silas and the Rise in the sidelines. Kind of picked the right points, took all the towers, played a very, you know, clinical, methodical game. So curious to see what changes we do have. We'll, of course, start with the draft here. So we'll move into champion select for game number two. Right now, the bands are looking very similar. Aatrox and Vladimir are gonna be the first to go. Yeah, and the one change I wanna see out of Illinois here is a bigger priority in some of those very strong meta picks. The Rise, the Silas's, the Akali's. These are picks that you, you should not just give away and not take something that is equally powerful in return. The fact that a team got Rise and Silas and there was not a very clear cut answer into it was worrying, but now that you have first pick, the banner went either Silas, and you might even first pick Rise yourself. Yeah, we got Jace, Aatrox, and Silas all being banned away, and there's Rek'Sai and Vlad on the Maryville side, so we'll see what their last ban is here. I think you also mentioned that maybe Project One needs a bit more priority in the jungle. Maybe something like a Jarvan early would be nice, because he did lose both Rek'Sai and Jarvan in phase two of the last draft. So last pick runs down, it is Aurelia that gets banned away. And that's how we see Maryville banning out the Rek'Sai in the first rotation instead. Last time it was banned in the second, but here, if you get rid of it early on, it is not a pick that they're gonna be able to first pick anymore because if I'm on the team, first pick me Rek'Sai every single day, it's fine. She's one of those champions that you just can't do. And Rise being the flex pick, but this is gonna be the second time that we see a Yumi if they hopefully lock it in and no. Clyde says, you know what? Today uh, is a thresh day. He he's had, a great thresh. Yeah, he had Pike available too. It got banned against him in the last game, but he'll take thresh this time. Saskia will take Varus, so picking a pretty safe and sturdy 2v2 to start things off. So really not showing very much. I think valuing the flexibility that the solo laners have. And Varus is really great at being able to combine yourself with a lot of assassins or powerful picks that may not necessarily be very good at engaging because he himself, Chains of Corruption, is more than enough for you to get the party started. And when you have a Thresh, it combos so nicely into your hook. There is the Tristana also, so the Bosch will take that this time. So Saskia's Trist in the last game, the Bosch decides he likes it. Nautilus also, pretty solid uh, mid laner slash support. I've seen it certainly more support recently, but always have the option to move it around. As GP locked in for Maryville. It's action packed in the bottom lane. Hooks on hooks with Thresh and Nautilus against each other. Nautilus with the recent buffs might be able to get the best out of that trade, but we'll have to see because the AD carries and the way that they use their spells in the lane will matter a lot. Varus makes a big difference here if he's able to proc those blighted arrows or if he's missing or hitting his cues. Oh, curious to see what happens to the rest of this draft because both junglers looks like they're gonna have to wait their turn to have their pick here. We're into phase two of bands. We've got Nico and Chauvin banned away on the Maryville side and CKG will lose Sejuani. Yeah, getting rid of that pick that was very pesky, very difficult to counter jungle it if you don't have the right matchup that can very, that just stay in your face and really do all that damage. And I think that that GP is already for now. So he's just saying, give it to me, the GP, I'll blind it, I'll play it into anything. I think he's that kind of player, especially up against Topopotamus, who he does not think is in the same realm of a player as he is. Certainly more of a tank player, so if you're confident your opponent is gonna play mostly tanks with, say, Vlad Band, then yeah, this big GP is pretty good in the tanks, as Nocturne gonna be the jungle of choice here for CKG. That Nocturne is gonna be really good at isolating Ryze in the side lanes. If he's gonna try to do the same thing that Niles did, just split push by himself, he's gonna be much better at taking him down than a Kane will by using that paranoia. No idea where it's coming from. The team is slow in reacting, but he's gonna have a very tough matchup up against Lee Sin, who is just gonna be all in your face 24 seven. I'm loving this change, man. He goes from Kane to the Lee Sin. Lee Sin's gonna be able to do so much more against this team without any tanks. If you get a kick into the back line, they're done for. Ooh, Rumble, the last pick here for Illinois. We have seen Rumble mid in the tournament already. There's a Velkos locked in though. Insta-locked, by the way. 
This is one of Wolf's best mid laners by far. He's really good at this champion. He's all about those skill shots, and when you can use trigonometry and all sorts of angles to figure out how to best disintegrate your opponents, Belkos shines the higher. Shines the brightest. Looks like it is Xeno's rise and Topopotamus's rumble for now. And as you predicted correctly, Gangplank top there for Niles. Especially with Velkos, not really much room to move those champions around. But it's only a bit more of a stable draft, I have to think, for Illinois. So here's a really powerful combination with Velkos and Nocturne that is often overlooked. When Nocturne uses Paranoia, one of the most powerful abilities for team fighting in the game, you can't see where Velkos is. And that lets him position himself to just laser down your team having no fear of getting engaged upon. And so look for these team fights when Nocturne presses Paranoia, when Velkos is in a really good position to hold, and those are gonna be just landslide victories. That combination is very nasty because it's so hard to go on Velkos during Paranoia. Certainly curious to see one of Wolfie's more signature champions, Velkos' stock also generally has risen quite a lot in recent patches. I think players are starting to cut under, hey, this pick's pretty good. Generally can only play in some certain matchups, but with the counter pick here, clearly comfortable in what he likely guessed was the Rise 1v1. But Xeno did look good in the last game on LeBlanc, and Rise is a very powerful champion. I think that's what's interesting about picks like Velkos. It's that they're not meta because they're bad. It's that they're not meta because not a lot of people play them or have even figured out how to play them. And then it takes players like Wolfie here to really show us, or even Froggen that we saw in the LCS, to show us what Velkos can really do in the right circumstances. And when you put Velkos on these players, it's a completely different beast. It's almost, you have to permaban it. So I'm, I have high hopes for what Wolfie can do here. Well, it does have Glacial Augment, so definitely be seeing more of the Twin Shadows GOP style build, which is fairly common. But it looks like maybe Illinois have something different in mind, stacking in this brush as four. All right, well, before we get there, we are gonna actually have a chat with someone from Illinois and Ovali who's standing by with a report. Thanks, Pastry. I am here with Coach Ido. Rough game for uh, your team. What are you guys gonna do to try to come back in this one? So I think the primary issue with last game was that we just weren't uh, confident in fighting. We were taking it really slow. We were bleeding out a lot. So the biggest advice that I had for my players was don't be scared, you know, come out swinging and take it to them. And I don't think that they're ready for a fast paced game that we can bring. Excellent advice. Best of luck to you and your team. Back to you guys. Thank you, Ovali. We'll have to see if that change does happen because it was, again, a very methodical play out there for Maribel when they got their lead. Of course, it is a new game in the best of five. Let's see if Illinois do answer back. It is Project One with a bit of help from Top Eponymous starting on the blue side of the jungle. That will be the same side as CKG who started on his red already. And I want to speak to what the coach is saying. Don't be afraid of fighting. And a big reason is that the meta is so different now with less vision. You do have to take these fights. You have to be bold. You have to say, it's time to fight whenever my team is getting in there. I need to find a way to help them out. And I think that that's one of the best things that League is able to do, to consistently change the game to a more enjoyable state. And I think it's great right now, but we have an all-in Niles against Papapotamus. They're actually trading back and forth. Holy Gets the nullifying old proc. That's pretty substantial, but Flame Spitter level one from Top Eponymous. Also a nice trading tool. Got the Comet proc there as well. Race to level two though is on. It's Doran Shield versus Corrupting Potion. So Niles now dinging two. Feeling pretty good that the trade didn't go too far south. It's a very aggressive gangplank making the most out of that level one. I was gonna ask you what you thought won. A, a pistol or a flamethrower? Looked like Rumble at the start, but hmm. then the Keystone well, rocked. A gun or a flamethrower? I guess it depends That's on rank, right? That's a hard question, yeah. Well, we'll find, you know what? We'll find out more as the top lane matchup continues to get played out. On a realistic level, I'd say the gun, because <laughs> you could shoot the tank. Oh, oh, that's the next level strategy. Crumbs is the 40 Too many video game <laughs> to know that if there's a tank, you shoot it. That's true. There's the Bosch taking a little bit of damage from the hail of arrows. Hopopotamus, though, already feeling forced out of this matchup. Just gets a Contumble and a Control Ward and TPs back in. And that's the place you want to be as GP. If you're winning lane as GP. Oh boy! Ignite in onto Saskia. Project One with a slow nails it there for Timmy Tommy. And that's first blood to the least in. The Bosch getting low, but Clyde now going to try and dance back on the wrong side of the rift. Flashes out. 
But has to keep running back towards his teammates. No one can chase him. Velkos was able to solo out Ryze into the mid lane, so he actually gets away. What should have definitely been two kills. The rest finds a way to get out of there because of the pressure mid and the jungler being caught side. Clyde even gets a plant, but very curious to see what happened there in mid lane. It's four sums down now. Xeno TPs back into the lane, but you mentioned a skilled Velkos player is very scary. We'll check that out in a moment as we check out this first blood. Timmy, tell me, had it on lockdown here. Yeah, the, the second that that stun connects, there's just no chance. Even gets the hook right after, and we're going to see this fight. And I think what part, what happens here is just the summoner disadvantage. One guy has teleport, the other one has heal. You just cannot win that trade when you don't have a combat summon. And Wolfie knows. Knows the limits of his champion, most certainly. So able to get that solo kill. Does have to go back. So Xeno with a bit of extra time here on the wave. But CS will stay about even. Wolf even might be a couple ahead as he goes back to collect the rest of this farm. Still very surprised by that TP for Top of Potom is kind of feeling scared in the matchup. I mean, after all the pressure. Niles just walked back into the lane. He still has his own teleport, and let's see what Project One can do. He doesn't have flash, and he only has one charge of his ward to use a ward hop here. So to connect the W from Rise onto Wolfie will be the most important step in setting up this game. He's a flashless Velkos though, does ward the other side of the lane. We'll see that control ward there. And uh, once again, I think this is something we're gonna have to start getting more used to. Clyde is out of the lane. First recall back, doesn't even buy boots, and straight to mid lane to check things out. So that's actually a really good strategy and a great habit that he has where you base and the first place for you to go as a mid laner is not back to your lane, but you go mid. You try to look for an opportunity to affect the map, you drop down the vision and you go back to the lane. You make it right on time so that you can catch experience with your AD carry. So, yes, he's notorious for roaming, but I think this is actually just a very smart move on him because now look at the vision he has until the bottom. And it's a really good defensive vision route with two controls that will let him and Varus play as aggressive as they'd like. Yep, Saskia also with the call, so just kind of hanging out, maybe expecting Clyde to leave a few more times. He wants to be a bit more self-sufficient in the lane and CS-wise, Feeling pretty good. Hooked on to Timmy Tommy. Just gets some damage down. But nothing much. Nautilus pretty tanky. It's Project One with the wraparound looking for Wolfie. Wolfie still no flash. Looks for the Q. Does nail it. But here's CKG behind him. Damage down. There's a flash forward. Gets the knockup. Gets the laser. Mafia double kill. Niles with the ulti from downtown. And MU turn it around. You can never forget about that Velkos laser. If you're not taking him out right away, he is going to delete you. And that's what happens. They also did not anticipate Niles having the ultimate to assist globally. Yes, he loses the 1v1 because he doesn't have his ult there, but he doesn't die. And that's all that matters for GP because so much pressure has been absorbed in the mid lane. And now the Nocturne is level six. It's going to get even crazier for Maryville. Yeah, I think right play for top of Potamus. Uses his ult, goes all in to try and take down the GP and does get the flash bot side though. Continue pressure. Saskio getting low. The ignite down the shots on, but the Bosch, it's actually a trade. The 80s are dead everywhere, but the Paranoia and Nocturne are going to sweep back in. Timmy Tommy blind getting chased down by a Nocturne. No flash, no hope, and absolutely dead. That is another kill for Nocturne in the span of a minute. He is very strong right now. He's going to be able to go back and almost complete his jungle item. If a Nocturne starts snowballing, those paranoia start being the thing of nightmares. Well, again, a very kind of fun 2v2 as the ADs just explode, but Timmy Tommy can't kill Cloud, and CKG can definitely kill Nautilus. Yeah, this is really all that matters for Nocturne. Make sure that every single ultimate gets you a kill. Start getting that ultimate cooldown reset. Start getting those items down. Well, almost at Warrior after that. Big influx of gold for Kim. So CKG off to a roaring start. Blasting one here for Top Apotamus. I like the Panache. A lot more aggressive there as Timmy Tommy roaming mid himself. Clyde there with a the lantern assist by Wolfie. Oh, he barely gets Ooh. out. The Ignite not enough. The Realm Warp over. Blast codes him over. Clyde, heroic save. Now he has to get out of there. What a hero play out of Clyde using the Blast Cone for his buddy, saving Wolfie before his flash down. Give this man MVP already. All right, well, Risk Scuttler will go over to Project One. A CKG almost got another kill on the Nautilus, was there to try and make sure things did not continue. That's the value of that Thresh leaving the lane and going straight to the mid lane first. And look at that, he makes it bottom oh. lane. Kill. Again, the hook accuracy there. The bot, wait, how did you die with Flash? He I, probably flayed the, the hop. I have to see this again. 
Clyde's a man that really knows how to lock down these poor carries. We better see some thresh bans from game three onwards, whether this is a win or loss, but Clyde is just doing way too much. Yeah, he had the option of playing black and said, no, nah, I like the thresh today, as we'll have a look at this play. Clyde with accurate hook. Jump? Nope. Yep. Seen it a million times. So if you're Tristana, by the way, and you're caught in that same pickle, bolt the thresh away first. We'll talk about fermentation in just a moment. CKG getting burned down. Top of bottom is picking one up. That's the return kill that you wanted to get. The rumble getting ahead. He's going to be your strongest mid-game power spike with that Leandris, with the equalizer. But yeah, if you're Tristana and you're in that situation, just ult Thresh first before you go for the hop. That's the only way that he can take you down, and that's what he's looking for. So if you just get him away from you, he can't do that. You jump, you survive. Certainly, again, have to credit Clyde's playmaking. Saw him uh, play an Ari out of a dash for her ulti, which was pretty nuts. Oh. And we saw him in the quarterfinal. So the Bosch, at least, returns back to lane, gets some turret plates for himself. Looking for two, but may only get one, although with Saskia being the only one there. I think feeling confident enough to try and take a second. Timmy Tommy pretty much forced to roam given how active Clyde's been on this map. I mean, really, just Moby Boots and the coin. I mean, you have to be in lane to collect the coins as yeah. well, so really not that interested in doing anything other than applying pressure. The souls of his opponents. That's what he's doing. It's good enough. Three assists, getting that gold. Okay, we just got a ping into the top side. Looks like Nocturne wants to use his next paranoia onto the rumble, but instead he backs off and sees that Rumble is just basing, so it's not worth his time. Yeah, I mean, Nile says, uh, you know, a little CS lead here. Well, actually, 15 is pretty significant, as Rumble did actually go back to recall and is not currently using the teleport, although the Salk Shoes will help in the next engagement. I think, as you pointed out, Illinois looking to move that Rumble down to some sort of team fight and really unlock the mid game power. I mean, the idea behind Rumble Nautilus is very easy to execute. You press Nautilus ultimate on somebody. The second that they get knocked up, they're going to get stunned when they drop to the ground. When the knockup happens, you drop the equalizer on top of them, guaranteeing a lot of burn time on that spell, which should be more than enough to take out members like Belkos, Varus, or even Gangplank. Maryville will get the Cloud Drake, so as everyone resets, Maryville see the opportunity and take down that first objective for themselves. Miles also going Hex Drinker, taking a detour there from his Triforce. So certainly respecting the power currently in the hands of Rumble. Project 1, though, trying to find a trade will start off the Rift Herald. This is always the worst thing. As a jungler, when you're trying to solo out the Herald, and then your top laner starts fighting right next to you, you know, listen, man, I'm trying to do the objective. I'm trying to be a team player here. Stop fighting for a second. Come help me out, or I'll help you in a little bit. He gets the objective, and it's before 14 minutes. So now he has the opportunity to get a big influx of gold to whoever wants to use it. Use of a lifetime. Okay, he does get it. Battle not going to land. In fact, maybe now Niles in a 1v2. He doesn't want to take this time, but we'll get out of there with the barrel speed and the Cloud Drake. Top bottom is also staying there in the top side for now. We'll have to keep eyes on Project 1 and see where he does want to drop that Herald. You want to use it on either Ryze or Tristana. Forget about helping the Rumble at this point. That Snowball is not going to affect the lane too much, whereas the Ryze or the Crisp will do a lot for the team in the later stages of the game. So are we sure that the dual lane for Maryville isn't CKG and Clyde? Because they've been together so often in this series so far. They're unpunished. They can do whatever they want. No one has gone on Saskio enough to make Clyde go back to the lane. So the more he continues to roam, as long as Varus is fine. Oh, we found someone. Good flash there from Xeno. Realm walks as well. So he'll get out of there. But again, one ulti traded there. Gets a summoner as well. PKG would have preferred the kill, but he'll take that trade. I would have really preferred to see that being utilized into the top lane when Rumble didn't have the flash. But now that Rice doesn't have his spell to escape, I think that he can just wait the cooldown out and use it once again on Xeno. So you really want to make sure that you convert into a kill. And we're going to see that Rift Hill convert into the first tower into the bottom lane before Tristan. Yeah, really nice influx of gold there. Good use of the Rift Herald there from Project 1. Gets the extra plates, gets the gold over to the team. Niles did ult the wave as GP to try and delay that, but committing the Rift Herald is enough to get it down. Oops, I closed. Shelly Lugget and CC'd. And we'll do battle with the duo lane and unfortunately probably not win. Much more assertive game out of University of Illinois this time around, being proactive with the Herald, right usage, 
giving the gold over to one of your better late game carries here. Another rotating to mid to hopefully crack Velikos, but a ramming five mid is a very dangerous proposition because you're losing out on a lot of golden experience. Yeah, the side lane gold will go over, but Illinois is trying to pick up the pace of the game. Few more tower plates here, only 20 seconds left to collect that gold, but extra resist will kick in. Maryville will, will rotate over, so the mid tower will stay alive. Yeah, that's dangerous. I mean, they're almost going to lose top lane here to Niles. It just was not necessary to go with five people mid if you weren't planning on going for a tower dive or anything of the sort. You miss out on a lot of gold experience on the sidelines. Many waves crash top lane that Hippopotamus could have used himself to try to catch up in levels. Level 11 for Rumble is a big power spike. That ultimate is really your only tool in these team fights when you have a Nautilus. Well, Niles will take that gold back. He's got 2k unspent. I don't think he's quite there for Trinity Force just yet, but he's getting awfully close as he heads back to base. And we've got two stopwatches in both of the engages of the teams. The jungler for Maryville, Nocturne, sitting with a stopwatch ready to build that GA. And Lee Sin having his own, but without a GA in sight, looking at that black lever. Did talk about the plate difference last time again. Illinois much more assertive here in the early stages. So actually end up upper plate and gold overall. Still in the hands of Maryville thanks to their three kill lead. But first structure going over to Illinois is nice given how much they struggled to find a tower in the last game. Now I just want to see them combo their abilities well when Nautilus and Rumble are there. You can even throw Leeson into the mix. Try to get some crazy shenanigans, kicking a target into the team with a Nautilus ultimate gets everybody stunned and knocked up. So they have a lot of wobble. Yeah, Wait, think about that, right? That's like the think about ultra that. next level. Right, you ult, Nautilus ult somebody, they move back and then Leeson kicks them into the team, gets a crazier knockup. You got all the angles. <laughs> you gotta get creative. Most if, people see right? A plus B. You gotta get creative. Trumps. If these compositions are difficult to execute, you need to be one step above and Surprising your opponent like that is one way to do it. Well, Storm appears to be brewing here around this next potential objective. Cloud Drake will be up in short order. There it is, spawning away. TP's ready for both top laners, but Top Eponymous is actually already down here. Oh my goodness, Belkos, you're a gross champion! Xeno going down. Gotta have priority in your lanes first. That's the lesson that University of Illinois can take here. You can't contest a dragon without having addressed the mid lane first. Maryville recognizes that they were in mid and they're able to rotate from mid into the objective much, much more easily than from the objective into the mid wave. Also still got GP ult as well as Varus ult. Wolfie though continuing to keep people out. GLP almost cooled back down. Ooh, good ult there on the CKG. He's gonna be forced to smite early, but Project One can't make it in. He actually blast cones over. But Maryville will just back away as Wolfie wants to defend the mid turret still. That's a cute attempt. I think if Rumble was level 11, he might have actually been able to take out CKG off that ultimate. So really shows or goes to show how had Rumble prioritized a little bit more of experience, would have been able to hit two levels of ultimate and might have been able to do a lot more in this fight. So League is a, a game of compounding actions. Well, again, that whose advantage is continuing to be stacked on the Maryville side, up to approaching 4k, about 3-ish right now. Niles also has now completed his Trinity Force and his Merc Treads. And Top of Bottom is actually going for the full Morello here. Well, there is a fair bit of healing. That's true, especially in his 1v1. Gangplank, Nocturne, and even Varus. You just want to get all the healing reduction out of the way. Two heals on the side of Wolfie and Saskia as well, so trying to mitigate some of that, making sure that they can really burst down targets the second that they engage, and no healing shenanigans can stop that. Still looking for the Leandries, or I guess the first part, the Haunting guys. But Rumble pretty strong right now with the double pen done. Again, looking for Topopotamus to find the combination with his teammates. And I think, again, oh, no. you've said it already, but using that vision, Topopotamus abandons a creep. Just didn't want to risk it. The fear of getting engaged upon by Nocturne is yeah. way too high. CKG almost up to level 11 for that rank 2 ulti. It's actually coming back off cooldown in just a few seconds. Now Wolfie's roaming together with the jungler. Everyone's just hanging around this Nocturne today. Life of the party. First gank plank ulti here. All right, GP ult, Nautilus ult. 
Does have the flash there as well. Gonna get snared up forever though. Flashes around the side. Might be okay. Gonna keep trying to dance out of there. But a great stop watch as Niles can't juke the Q's and Zeno. Had enough. Flashes in. Uses the E. But he trades. Whoa. What the? Holy moly. Did you see that he dodged the tower shot with the ult? So there is Round one four. very small window of invulnerability or wow. ability as Rysol. You can dodge Carthus ult if you're slick Damn. enough with it. But that was really well played by Zeno. CKG, though, unfortunately collecting his kill. I guess Topopotamus had a right to be scared because CKG kills him without using the ulti. He did. He knew that they were going to respond into the bottom lane when his own team was going to the top side. Unfortunately, not able to use the ultimate to really bin out the wave and not get dope. But let's take another look at yes, this please. dive because this was nutty. Okay, Gangplank ultimate, of course. You got to use that first, clear out the minion wave, and Rai starts tanking. He's still tanking, backs off. Lee Sin gets the aggro again. Zanya's Nautilus has. This is great. I think Nautilus could have stayed a little bit longer, but this is the part that just got me. What situational wow. awareness? Walking back into the ulti, being like, I'm not going to live if I don't do this. <laughs> Zeno Bravo. also autoed the barrel that would have cleared the wave when that dive started. So Bravo. extremely well played by the Rise. Niles finally bested in some sort of uneven situation. Last LCS big play right there. But Maryville still win the bigger end of the trade. And I think that's been the story of the series so far for me is that Illinois, yes, they're being a bit more aggressive. They're taking opportunities and taking initiative, but Maryville are so well positioned that whenever a trade starts, like, okay, sack our top laner, we're trading somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, Gangplank is 50 CS up on the Rumble and his ultimate is essentially an equalizer, right? You drop it down on a CC target, lots of damage, nobody wants to walk through it. So what they can contribute to a team fight Ultimate-wise, it's relatively the same, but GP's barrels are going to be able to do a lot more work from a distance than what Rumble can do. It's just not strong enough to tank any of the members of Maryville. I like that CKG pops the, uh, pops the lens to see the Nautilus, and the first reaction is to go forward. Clyde instantly trying to hook into the patch of Rush to see if they can get something started. Now going to rotate up with his team, taxes Wolfie's wave, and they're going to walk back down to the bottom lane. But uh, that turret league we were talking about before has melted for Illinois. Maryville just find the right trades, they get the sieges down, and now they're in another position where they can try and play out this game in the same manner they did in the first one. And yeah, get your split pusher ahead with red buff. GP just cannot stand here. Wow. Having to flash out of the barrel. That's huge. That means Niles can dive game plan or dive Rumble on his own. I mean, I credited Xeno for his auto attack on the barrel before, but Rumble just doesn't have the same luxury. He's a melee champ. He's got to slap it with the, the flame arm. Yeah. Try and get the barrel down. If you want to compare the two plays, Niles deterred three people on like one fight on Nautilus. Oh, Hook's still good. So much CC. We'll be on a rampage, by the way. Yeah, this team is on a tear today. They are merciless, and the hooks from Clyde are just one of the best parts they have going on. And when you start to consider that Wolfie's getting solo kills, that Niles is winning the lane on his own. That Clyde can roam and find more like hooks like Serious Clyde. We seem just got flayed out of a Q, I'm pretty sure. And that's a realm all out for Zeno, but Project One, not so lucky. And straight to Baron Maryville. They are pulling no punches today. They have no way to answer this. The best case scenario would be Rumble teleports and tries to carpet bomb this. But look at the vision. Everything is warded. They see every entrance. They have control wards in the pit and outside of it. Completely dark. They have no idea. Their best bet is, can we find a way to trade an ocean out of this? And that's just going to have to be the consolation. Yep. Guys. It certainly is a consolation here. I'll take it, but now Maryville on the Baron power play with almost a 10,000 gold lead. My goodness. Again, it just feels like this team, you know, for all the, the, the great plays they've shown, for all the individual skill they've showcased, a lot of the time it just feels like nothing's happening, and then you look back up and they're 8,000 gold ahead. Well, remember that Gangplank is a champion that typically is supposed to fall behind in lane. If you're 100 to 70 CS as GP, you're great. You're like, that's awesome because Gangplank gets more gold per minions than most champions with the parley with the barrel that kills. But he has more CS than Rumble. That means that his gold lead is even more ballooned than typical. And that's a big source of the item discrepancy. Look at that. 3,600 gold exclusively in the top lane. And the news is not much better across the other lanes here. That's the entire Infinity Edge. Right? That's a whole item. That's a whole expensive item. Right now with the Ghost Blade. Pairing in with the Trinity Force for more immediate power with the Lethality. Also, just a good little utility item. See if Maryville can find a way to crack this base. Illinois 
defense of their structures for the next two minutes will be of paramount importance. They have a way to do it. They have to find Wolfie when Clyde is not around, or even Clyde, and just Nautilus all into Rumble all. That's the play. That's the way that they can stall out this fight and get the engagement they want. Yeah, Wolfie or Saskio, there's two good targets. Even Thrashers. Usually tough press to land on someone out, especially if you can find more than one. They're actually going to go in onto Niles instead. They pop the equalizer, but Niles, defensive paranoia, defensive GP. Oh, that's going to give them the top out of turret. UI can't see anything, and when they open their eyes, like the bad news is the turret already dead. Realm Warp in for Timmy Tommy, trying to find the depth charge. But there's Clyde with the stopwatch, going to just wipe the fight here. That's Bosch down. Maryville might have just found a way straight to the Nexus. Oh my god, Clyde! Right at the end, finds Zeno, gets the stasis, forces the flash, and that's good night. One more member of Illinois. They're just dropping like flies in the base. Even hooked Project One out of the fountain. No more healing for you. They're gonna seal the deal. And those kills, that's four clean kills. That's straight into the base. And with the Baron, they will end the game and put themselves at match point in the series. <laughs> Maryville University is here to play up to zero. Very clean game, back to back. University of Illinois has to reassess everything they've done so far because Maryville has an answer and more at every minute. I mean, I'm starting to like run out of praise at this point. Every player seems to be playing well. Team seems very well disciplined in the matchup, playing things out. They've played flexible picks. They've shown outplays, they've shown individual skill. They've shown a lot of poise on the stage as well. I mean, a team that's willing to be this patient and still makes their wins look this convincing is a great thing, given that these are this is a team trying to once again reclaim the championship. It is, and they're not really showing that much, right? They're showing a few picks that we already knew they could play. Clyde showed the Thresh yesterday. We know that Niles has been a beast, but the Velkos, we already know that Wolfie can play it. They're playing their signature picks and looking great doing so. And I think Illinois kind of had the right idea, but just needed to pull the trigger a little faster. Part of that, yes, comes down to how you set up and how your vision is and how your lanes are looking. But at some point, I think Illinois just have to say, all right, it's, this is not the best position to go in. But at this point, you are not finding the best positions. You must make yeah. a slightly more desperate play. They need to start by prioritizing. Let's win lane. Let's get out of the laning phase even or ahead. And then we can start looking to the mid game because they have not gotten past laning phase well. Well, Maryville are poised to sweep their ways to the final. And to get a breakdown of game two, let's hand it off to the State Farm Analyst Desk. Thank you so much, Pastry Time and Crumbs. Welcome, everybody, to the State Farm Analyst Desk. My name is Latigris, joined by Mark, Mark Z. Zimmerman, and the top laner from Waterloo. We have Shauner this time around. Shauner, how's it feel being over on this side of things? Quite a different experience. Wasn't sure what to expect, but I'm glad to be here. Yeah, and I'm sure that both these teams weren't necessarily sure of what to expect going into that game. Some differences in the drafting from Illinois, but nonetheless, they still had some struggles against Maryville. Yeah, they definitely struggled. I like the overall idea of having a little bit more proactivity, especially like the Lee Sin pick, being more aggressive pre-six, having more gank opportunities, and some of those changes I, I really appreciated. Uh, but I still think you saw Maryville having really good answers. Yeah, and Sean, or you've been very familiar with both of these teams going throughout and it seems that Illinois was pulling from some of their strategies that they had seen throughout the qualifying process. Yeah, especially seeing what happened in game one getting sort of split push to death. Uh, they went with a sort of death ball comp, which is what has been really successful for them in the Big Ten network. You know, main part of belt getting that death ball comp, the Tristana pick, as well as a comfort pick for mid and top. And we saw that out of Zeno's rise. Yeah, I think Xeno's rise was something that we were talking about at the end of the previous post-game segment. And like, okay, that's what we thought they were doing when they left it up. This time they first pick it, and it's supposed to be their strong point. This is their kind of star player who we're expecting to see snowball big leads. But he had a re really hard time this game uh, against Wolf's uh, Velkaz. And it's not the most common counterpick, but there are still a fair amount of Velkazes that get played into normal mages. Yeah, we were hoping for that rise. We saw it in action, but it wasn't the action that we wanted or what you wanted probably either, Shauner. Yeah, it was a really comfortable pick for Xeno, but I think maybe the pressure got to them. Not only that, the global pressure from the Gangplank, as you can see in this play happening right here. Turn around two for zero on a play that should have worked with the pre-level six Nocturne. Yeah, I mean, all game long just kind of got picked on even after the laning phase broke open. I thought, you know, Illinois did a good job of slowing the game down. They actually took a couple turret plates. They used the Rift Herald very well. But despite that fact, they kept getting picked off in bad situations like that. And they kept losing Drakes. And the game started to snowball out of control. Cloud Drakes galore. 
in this tournament. There's a lot of, I don't know what it is with college players and Cloud Drake. I don't, is there some Gotta secret? go fast. I gotta go fast. <laughs> gotta go fast, get to that graduation line, and in this case, <laughs> the to get me out. Line. Yeah, they wanna move on. They wanna stay on that stage for the entirety of their careers. But in this stage performance, it all comes down to that final fight that we saw to close it out in game number two, with the victory going over to Maryville. So many things had gone wrong over the course of the game that the death ball comp had finally uh, not really gotten together. And so here they try and pick a final 5v5 team fight in the top lane, but they just burn their rumble ult in the mid lane. So when the Nautilus goes in and tries to lock down multiple members, that's where you want that death ball on top. And there's just no more follow up. Niles had already baited it out. Yeah, once you blow that rumble out in the mid lane, I'm not really sure how you play that top lane fight. Maybe try to concede, wait for it to come back up, drop the inhib. But they committed, you know, just stuck with the play and the results were not what they expected. Interestingly enough, going into this matchup, you have Maryville determined to get that championship title again. But Illinois, on the other hand, focused so much on this rematch from last year. So what do you think that Illinois needs to do to keep themselves within the series? I got to say, it's kind of an uphill battle for me. I think that they have some uh, problems in their solo lanes, kind of staying even. They did a better job in the bot lane this time. In the first game, Saskio kind of ran away with it, but they stabilized for the most part. But I think with what we've seen, I mean, even Shauner with his GP yesterday, uh, it was incredible how far ahead he got of top epotamus is in the second time in a row that we've seen the Jace, or the, excuse me, the uh, GP kind of blind. So I'm worried as they go back onto game three that like you could just give GP over again. And going into the next game, it's going to be Maryville over on blue side. So what do you think we can expect from them? From Maryville, I think just keep up that sort of top lane dominance that they've been getting going on. Uh, on the side of Illinois, I think they try to want to neutralize him. You know, top bottom is, can do that. He has certain picks. I don't think they've been pulling them out in this series. Let's see uh, if they can get a good of, oh, sorry, neutralizing pick. Yeah, I mean, I, I would be curious what he said because when you played against him, you crushed his Vladimir, which is supposed to be a good matchup into the GP, the Rumble as well this time around, but he was losing trades level one and two. So I think they might need to ban the GP to find something else. There's There are a lot of picks that do counter GP in laning phase, so it is possible, but he hasn't shown the proficiency to execute on those quite yet. And that's Niles, the best player probably in this, you know, out of all 10 players that you're asking to shut down his GP. I think it's a little bit too tall of an order. A lot of people are hoping that Niles is going to be the next NA homegrown talent. He's proving the licorice himself comparisons. so far. Yeah, everyone's loving it. And Shauna, I have to say, we loved having you here on the desk. Thank you so much for joining us. We have plenty of players that have been with us throughout this broadcast. But Maryville are the ones looking to smash their way to the finals. See if Illinois can bounce back in Game 3 when we return. There's gank playing Colty here. All right, GP ult, Nautilus ult. Does have the flash there as well. Gonna get snared up forever though. Flashes around the side, might be okay. Gonna keep trying to dance out of there, but a great stop watch as Niles can't juke to Kuz and Zeno. Had enough, flashes in, uses the E. But he trades, whoa, what the? Holy moly, did you see that he dodged the tower shot with the ult? So there is Round one four. very small window of invulnerability or untargetability as Rizal. Lee Sin gets the aggro again. Zanya's Nautilus has to, this is great. I think Nautilus could have stayed a little bit longer, but this is the part that just got me. What situation wow. awareness walking back into the ulti being like, I'm not gonna leave if I don't do this. <laughs>